A student ate gas station sushi for breakfast. This is what happened to his stomach. TB is a 22-year-old man presenting to the emergency room with facial swelling, shortness of breath, and hives. He tells the admitting nurse that he had had severe right-sided lower abdominal pain for at least the last three days. You see, TB was a college student. During his freshman year, he found out that the grocery would toss out their expired food and he could pick it from the waste bin to eat. If it was edible, he took it. The grocery store would throw away a bag of apples even if just one was rotten, but to TB, all the other apples were just fine. On the internet, he read that over one billion tons of food every year is thrown away. Clearly, this was bad for the environment, so picking that disposed food and eating it was doing his part. His reward for saving the earth was eating for free. As TB became more experienced in finding his food, he became more relaxed in what qualified as edible. Instead of tossing rotten apples, he eventually just ate around it. If bread was moldy, just cut out the bad parts. Everything else is fine, he thought. This got to the point where he'd pick pizza, hot dogs, and sushi from the back of the gas station at night. TB's favorite was Monday because that was when the gas station threw away their weekend sushi. Sure, it's a couple days old, he thought, but it's refrigerated. It's sealed. There's no reason anything could be wrong with it, he thought. So every Tuesday morning, TB had gas station sushi for breakfast. He did this for months, and he was fine. One Monday night, TB was heating up a suspicious gas station pizza for dinner. If you heat it up for a really long time in the microwave, you clean off all the bacteria, so then it's no longer suspicious, he thought. Earlier that morning, he had his normal sushi breakfast before class, and he was feeling great. But immediately after finishing his expired gas station pizza, TB felt like he couldn't breathe. He could feel his tongue expanding. His stomach started to cramp. His face started to swell. A sensation rippled through his cheeks as he was brought down to the floor. As the hours go by, TB laid down in the bathroom with minimal relief. He felt his stomach folding over itself over the next few days. He woke up every night sweating. His friends made fun of him, saying that he clearly had been getting Botox because his lips were so swollen. He couldn't take it anymore as he brought himself to the emergency room where we are now. At examination, TB's abdomen was a little swollen. There was tenderness in the right lower quadrant. There was nothing suspicious about his stool, but his blood test was borderline. Counts of his white blood cells were near the upper limit of normal. Could be a problem, maybe not. TB told the doctors about his food habits. He had been garbage picking for so long, he had so many successes that he was just proud of all the money that he saved. He told them that he was sure whatever he picked out of the garbage wasn't rotten. It hadn't come into contact with flies or rats, and that he always physically examined himself, visually and by smell. He told the doctors that the expired gas station pizza that he last ate was a little suspect. He knew beforehand that it was sketchy. Maybe he didn't microwave it long enough, but he also didn't mention anything about the sushi because he didn't think anything of it. Everything was definitely that pizza. Over the next six hours, TB was observed and the physical exam was repeated. Abdominal tenderness, guarding, and rebound tenderness were found in the lower right quadrant. If you look at an anatomical model, this right lower region of the abdomen is where the appendix is. A CT scan showed some inflammation in the area and other features that point to appendicitis. TB was sent in for an appendectomy, the removal of his appendix. Appendicitis is caused by a blockage of the appendiceal lumen, or hole. The blockage could be from undigested food, from some inflammation, or maybe that twisting and turning that he felt in his stomach was actually his appendix doing just that. But the reality was, after it was removed, TB's appendix didn't really look that inflamed. It was actually kind of normal and unremarkable. The region around it also looked okay. The surgeon told TB afterwards that they had seen worse. The doctors advised TB to stop scavenging his food, to just get a meal plan from the cafeteria or something that didn't involve garbage. TB argued back that cafeteria food was the real garbage as he was wheeled off. And his surgical recovery was uncomplicated. At the end, he felt a little better. At home now, TB started picking expired food again, but this time, no more pizza. In a few weeks after his surgery, he started creeping back to his old foods. During this time, TB would start to experience crampy abdominal pain. Sometimes, he'd sit there in the bathroom and struggle for a movement. Every day, he'd feel exhausted and tired. The next day, TB went to the gas station for the first time. He bought that sushi that he had been picking from the garbage all of these months. He was going to have a legitimate breakfast this time. But immediately after finishing this raw fish, 
A rash quickly developed all over TB's body. His face started swelling and he became short of breath. His stomach started cramping. As he got down to the floor, his roommates called for an ambulance and he's brought back to the emergency room again. On examination this time, TB's blood pressure was 60 over 30. He was in anaphylactic shock. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, was administered to him with fluid resuscitation to increase his blood pressure. This is so that oxygen can get back to his organs. Over the next several hours, TB was managed as he was admitted into the hospital. This sudden onset, abdominal pain and nausea with a history of constipation could mean that something is blocking his intestines and TB would likely need surgery again. An abdominal radiograph showed markedly dilated loops of bowel, strongly suggesting that there is some kind of blockage going on. A blood test revealed a high count of white blood cells, meaning that TB might have some sort of infection. This was confirmed because at surgery, parts of his intestines by where his appendix used to be were removed. The findings showed that the inside walls of those removed parts were thickened and accompanied by inflammation, meaning that white blood cells had swelled up the region with fluid causing the blockage. But why would those white blood cells be there? Looking at the samples of that tissue underneath a microscope, clumps of immune cells were gathered all around multiple worm-like larvae that had embedded in the tissue, meaning that a parasite had been living and crawling around this whole time. In the recovery room, doctors asked TB what his last meal was, and when he answered gas station sushi, they confirmed this nematode parasite is named Anasacus simplex, a common roundworm found in raw fish. The problem with a parasite found in raw fish sushi that causes severe illness is that it might be more common than you think. In Japan, at a wholesale fish market, 98% of its mackerel and 94% of its cod was found to carry Anasacus simplex. 40% of fish sold at a market in Spain were also found to contain the worms. And in the United States, one study found one in 13 chance of consuming an Anasacus larva in salmon sushi, meaning that if you've ever had that delicious fish, it's likely that you've come in contact with the parasite in some form. This isn't by chance. Almost all of us have been warned at some point in time about eating raw fish, and this parasite's life cycle tells us everything about its prevalence. The Anasacus parasite's primary hosts are whales and dolphins, animals called cetaceans. Primary host means that Anasacus lives as adults inside the stomach of these animals. This is important because during the Anasacus adult life, they lay eggs in their host's stomach. The host then passes these eggs in their feces, which are then spread all over the sea. Those eggs develop into embryos in water as they hatch into larvae where they're eaten by crustaceans like krill. Inside the krill, the larvae mature. Krill can then be eaten by larger fish and squid who accumulate the parasite. Anasacus grows into an adult inside the fish and his fish eat other fish. The parasite gets passed on to one another as then the big fish accumulate all of these nematodes. Normally, a whale or porpoise will eat these fish and then complete the Anasacus life cycle, but somewhere in this pathway, humans come into play, like TB. Humans that eat infected, uncooked fish that hasn't previously been frozen, me included. Anasacus enters our GI tract, but it's not supposed to be there. It's not meant to be in an environment like a human stomach, so it tries to burrow into the mucosa or the inner lining where it wrecks havoc as it damages the tissue by digging deeper to get out. The immune system immediately reacts by sending huge amounts of white blood cells and inducing what looks like an allergic reaction, just like in TB. But the story isn't over for him. After recovering from surgery, he still had epigastric pain and nausea. A CT scan showed thickened stomach mucosa. He was sent in for endoscopy and another set of roundworms, Anasacus again, was found and extracted, meaning that TB was likely exposed to it more than once. The normal appearing appendix after appendectomy meant that he probably didn't have appendicitis, but instead already had Anasacus around that ileocecal region right by it. The unnecessary operation was suspected by the first surgeon, but it wasn't clear at that time what was going on because TB never told anyone about eating raw fish. They didn't know what they were looking for. Anisacidosis is a rare infection and can be mistaken for Crohn's disease, appendicitis, and many other things. And without him mentioning eating raw fish, the doctors missed that possibility altogether. The leftover pizza that TB kept talking about at that first hospital admission could have been caused by food poisoning, but abdominal pain in the lower right quadrant of his severity 
is not typically something that you'd get from spoiled pizza. It was only at the second hospital admission that an Anasakis larva was found in the walls of his intestine. His immune system had been reacting to this by sending an inflammatory response in white blood cells to the region, causing it to swell and form a structure that eventually obstructed his bowels. Anasakis can't live inside human stomachs for very long, but in some rare cases, they can be absorbed into the liver, the pancreas, and cause massive damage there that would look like tumors on radiographic imaging. These parasitic lesions have been mistaken for metastatic carcinomas in literature. TB's second infection came after he bought his gas station sushi, ironically. In this case, the Anasakis larva stopped short in his GI tract and burrowed into the lining of his stomach, causing acute abdominal pain and nausea. The rash and swollen face looked like an allergic reaction and was again a response by the immune system to a foreign pathogen, as his body detected something damaging his stomach. All of this from raw fish sushi that was likely not handled well, because while Anasakis is relatively prevalent in fish, we have measures to prevent this from happening. Do you remember that 1 in 13 chance of eating anisakis in salmon? Well, the study specified that those larvae weren't alive when found. Anisakis needs to be living to cause problems because it causes that damage by burrowing into the mucosa, and it can't do that if it's not alive. And in the United States, most salmon served raw is frozen first, which would kill the nematode, but also mean that you still would have eaten a deceased worm anyways. That 8% is kind of unsettling if you think about it. There's really no way to prevent what happened to TB other than just to not eat any raw fish at all, because unless you do it yourself, you may never know who prepared your food or how it was prepared. And it's no surprise that of all the Anasakis cases reported, majority of them come from coastal Japan. Although there's been an increase in the number of reports from coastal regions of Europe, most notably Spain and Italy, as well as from South America. If you're in the United States, eating sushi from a well-known restaurant that has a good track record is probably going to be okay. But for sushi packaged from an unknown place and put on a shelf where it's left for a couple of days and then discarded because it's past its sell-by date, well, I hope you're now aware of the risks of what you're eating if you're thinking of that. Having learned a valuable lesson in food caution through permanently losing parts of his GI tract, TB was able to make a recovery. Please don't let this video make you be scared of sushi. I still eat it once a week. That study was 1 in 13. Well, they were all dead larvae, and 1 in 13, this was written in 1990. I would at least hope that it's a little bit better today, but I can't say for sure. And so if you have any medical friends who refuse to eat sushi, it's because they've heard of cases like this one. It's still a rare occurrence here in the United States because we are pretty good at handling our food. Just be careful of what you eat. Take care of yourself and be well.